husband, Russell, is an artist. And I am May, and I have an interest in true crime. We decided to merge our two interests together. Enjoy this calming visual while listening to a tragic story. This is Stuart and Crime. Robert Curtis, 41, was murdered on June 4, 1935. T.O. Curtis, 13. Gloria Jean Curtis, 11. Billy Burke Curtis, 10. Robert Curtis, Jr., 9. Margie D. Curtis, 7. And Marcia Jack Curtis, 5 were all murdered on March 16, 1938. By a family member one should always be able to trust, the man's wife and the children's mother, Lily May Curtis. Lily May and Robert Curtis were married and had nine children together. When Robert went to sleep on June 4, 1935, he did not know that on that night his wife would make sure he never woke up again. Lily May waited until her husband was fast asleep and then put a pistol to his head and shot him. There were no reports explaining why she shot her husband. But on August 8, 1935, Lily May Curtis was given a five-year suspended sentence and was released from jail to care for her nine children. But just three years later, Lily May realized she could not care for all her children. So on March 16, 1938, she waited until seven of her children went to sleep, then shot six of them to death. After killing her six youngest children, she woke up the seventh and eldest child, Travis, who was 15, confessed what she did, and then sent him to go get police. Travis ran to the home of a neighbor, and they called police. When the sheriff arrived, the boy told him the direction his mother had taken toward the woods. Sheriff Sample looked for the woman. When he couldn't find her, he called out her name and heard her answer close by. Lily May walked out from where she was hiding and told the sheriff she had placed the murder weapon under the steps of the farm home. And then she looked at Sheriff Sample and stated, I had no money and they are better off dead. The sheriff arrested Lily May and then walked into the farmhouse to find the bodies of the six youngest Curtis children in their beds, all shot through their hearts with a 22 caliber pistol. Her oldest two children, Opal, 18, was married and living with her husband, and son Vance, 17, was visiting his grandparents at the time of the crime. But it seems like they would have been spared after hearing Lily May's full confession to District Attorney Wardlow Lane. This is her statement. Last night, I decided to kill them because we had no money, and I was unable to support them. That is, not physically able, and not able in the way of money. I had not undressed when I went to bed, and I was thinking kind of about killing them when I went to bed, and I knew it was wrong to kill these children. They were too young to support themselves, and were better off dead. I did not kill the oldest one, Travis, because he is big enough to find work for himself. He would get out and work. So I kissed them all goodnight and sent them to bed, and then got my gun out of my dresser. I went back into the kitchen and sat there, with the gun on my lap, and waited to be sure that all were asleep. Then I went to the bed of T.O. and shot him first. Then I killed the others according to their ages, leaving the baby until the last. None of them woke up, although several struggled after I shot them. However, the others slept through the shootings and I had to wake Travis and tell him what I had done. On April 6, 1938, the state agreed to waive the death penalty in exchange for Lily Mae Curtis pleading guilty to one of the six murders. She agreed 
and pled guilty to the murder of her son, Tio Curtis. During the sentencing phase, three were called upon to testify. Fred Hudson, a hardware dealer, testified he sold Mrs. Curtis a 22 caliber pistol the day before the shootings and identified the gun. Justice of Peace Ben Eddins, who had returned an inquest verdict of death at the hands of Lily Mae Curtis in each case, testified the children were lying dead in their beds in one room when he arrived at the scene about midnight. L.S. Oates, a health officer, testified that each child showed powder burns near the heart where each was shot, and that he believed Miss Curtis was able to distinguish right from wrong, but that she was not mentally normal. District Attorney Wardlow Lane was also sworn in as a witness and presented two written statements Mrs. Curtis made to him when detailing the tragedy. He stated, Mrs. Curtis moved the youngest child from a bed in another room and placed him with the other children in a single room of the farm home. She placed a 22 caliber pistol at the heart of each child, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest, then kissed each child goodbye. After 15 minutes deliberation, the jury sentenced Lily Mae Curtis to 99 years for the murder of her son, T.O. Another jury ended up sentencing her to 99 years each on four of the other murders, and the suspended sentence for the killing of her husband three years earlier was added on, totaling over 500 years in prison. Yet she served only 42 years of her sentence. Lily May was released in October of 1970, reportedly released early for good behavior. She was 70 years old. She moved in with her daughter Opal and lived with her in East Texas until her death 10 years later, on February 3, 1980. She was buried next to the husband that she shot and killed 45 years earlier, and in the same cemetery as the graves of the six children she brutally murdered. Her three surviving children lived long lives. Opal Curtis Jacobs died in 1991, Vance Alvin Curtis died in 2006, and James Travis Curtis died in 1987. There are five different categories that fall under the umbrella of filicide. They are 1. Altruism, which is when the parent kills the child because he or she may perceive it to be in the child's best interest. It may be reality-based, like the child suffers from a terminal illness, or perceive the suicide of the parent, as the parent feels it would be unfair to leave the child behind to face the cruel world. 2. Acute psychosis. The parent kills the child based on ideas that are inconsistent with reality. For example, the parent believes the child has been possessed by the devil. 3. Unwanted child. The parent kills the child that he or she regards as a hindrance. 4. Accidental. The child's death is an unintentional outcome of parental physical abuse. Or 5. Spousal revenge. The parent kills the child in an effort to exact revenge on the other parent. A paper in a March edition of the journal Forensic Science International provided the first comprehensive statistical analysis of filicide in the United States. Drawing on 32 years of data on more than 15,000 arrests from 1976 to 2007. It showed that over time, the total number of filicide cases in the country has remained relatively stable at around 500 a year. The data allowed the researchers to determine the most common filicide scenarios. The most likely scenario is a father killing a son, 29.5% of cases. A mother killing a son is second, with 22.1%. A mother was slightly more likely to kill a daughter, 19.7% of cases, than a father was, 18.1%. The rarest instances were stepmothers killing either a stepson, 0.5%, or a stepdaughter, 
0.3%. Here are some stories that are examples of each type of filicide. The main murder we discussed in this episode is an example of altruism filicide, as Lily Mae Curtis killed her children as she felt they would not be able to take care of themselves, and she believed killing them was in their best interest. Jeanette Michelle Hawes stories an example of acute psychosis filicide. 23-year-old Jeanette Michelle Hawes stabbed her two children to death in an Augusta, Georgia gas station restroom in November 2007, as she believed her children were possessed by demons. Months before this tragedy, Ms. Hawes became paranoid and believed people she worked with at the post office were out to get her. She began having crying spells and was either laid off or fired. Then she began hearing voices, and in July 2007, she was prescribed an antidepressant because she was depressed, anxious, and not sleeping well. But in the days leading up to the stabbings, the paranoia increased. She began a bizarre journey to Atlanta, back to Augusta, and then to Aiken, with her two children in tow. The voices she had been hearing for months were now directing her actions. So on November 29, 2007, she picked up a kitchen knife and walked about a mile with her children to the Texaco gas station on Lupkin Road, walked into the bathroom and stabbed her little girl 11 times over her heart piercing it once. The toddler also had a cut on her hand consistent with a defensive wound. The boy had two cuts in the heart area and four small puncture marks on his chest. One of the cuts went through his heart. Amanda Thomas was the assistant manager of the gas station on that day and sensed that something was wrong with Jeanette as she was a regular customer. She watched her walk into the store that afternoon with her one-year-old son and three-year-old daughter. She looked very distraught and took her two children into the bathroom. Moments later, Manager Thomas heard the kids cry, then heard a different sound, one that is indescribable. Thomas and three customers tried to unlock the bathroom door, but couldn't get it open and called 911. When the deputies arrived, they had to pry open the locked door with a screwdriver. When they opened the door, they found Haas lying on the floor with her two children. The mother had a black steak knife in her possession, covered in blood. Three-year-old Shakela Haas and one-year-old Jordan Haas were pronounced dead at Medical College of Georgia Hospital. Both children had died of multiple stab wounds to the chest. Two doctors examined Haas before her trial, and they were both clear with their diagnosis. Ms. Haas was insane at the time she killed her children and that she suffered a psychotic break common to people as they develop schizophrenia. One of the doctors testified that Haas told him, I didn't want them to have to run anymore. I was trying to protect them, to stop them from being chased. I heard voices in the bathroom telling me to stab my kids. She was found not guilty by reason of insanity in 2009 and sent to a state mental hospital. Megan Huntsman's story is an example of an unwanted child filicide. In 2014, a Utah man named West had family members helping him clean out the garage at his home so that he could move out of the halfway house following his time in prison. The first box his daughter opened appeared to have a dead baby in a bag. As police searched the garage, Megan Huntsman was being interviewed by police. Initially, she insisted that the baby in the bag had been stillborn, delivered shortly after her husband went to prison. She hid the body because she didn't know what else to do. But about an hour into the interview, police at the scene reported that a second baby had been found, and then another, and it seemed like the list of babies found grew each time the officers opened a new box. Somewhere in boxes inside of boxes, wrapped in layers of plastic or blankets, sometimes taped shut with electrical tape. 
In all, it was determined that the bodies of five baby girls and two baby boys had been hidden in that garage for years. Megan eventually admitted that she had murdered all but one, stating, In some small way, I wanted to help them avoid the terrible life I would have given them. I deprived my little babies of the opportunity of life. As she explained her story to police, detectives asked her why she had let her three oldest children live. She explained that her first two children were born before she and her husband started using meth. Yet she was on drugs when she became pregnant with her third living daughter. Her life was spared because other people knew of that pregnancy. After that, she was careful to never disclose her pregnancies. West, who investigators determined was the father of all six children and a seventh that was stillborn, insisted he was never aware his wife had been pregnant with those seven children. Megan Huntsman was 39 when she was charged with killing her six newborns in Utah ranging from 1996 to 2006 and faced five years to life on each count of felony murder. Six of the seven children were born alive and Huntsman herself admitted to either strangling or suffocating them all. She pled guilty on February 12, 2015. At the sentencing hearing, two of Megan's daughters submitted letters on their mother's behalf at trial. Describing her as a loving parent who had done a good job caring for them, rather than a cold killer as some see her. They wrote, Nobody could guess my mom would do anything like this. No matter what anyone thinks you are, you are a good person. Megan's youngest sister, Jamie Huntsman, stated her sister had always been loving, but timid and shy. She is not a monster. She's not evil. From what I understand, she was scared. Family members said they didn't know about the methamphetamine that ruled the couple's lives. Despite her family's testimony, prosecutors insisted that there was no way to deny that Megan Huntsman had carefully plotted to kill each of her six children without any of her family noticing and cleaning up all the evidence before they could see. She was sentenced to six terms of five years to life in prison on April 20, 2015. Alexandra Tobias' story is an example of accidental filicide. Alexandra V. Tobias, 22, was arrested on January 19, 2010 for killing her three-month-old baby, Dylan Lee Edmondson. On the day of the incident, Tobias said she became enraged because she was playing a computer game called Farmville on Facebook and the baby wouldn't stop crying. So she shook the baby, laid him on the living room couch, and went to smoke a cigarette to gain her composure. But the family dog apparently knocked the boy off the couch, causing him to cry again. So she picked him up and shook him again, which she said caused him to stop breathing, and that is when she called 911. Paramedics arrived and took Dylan to Wolfson's Children's Hospital in grave condition, with injuries to his head and a broken leg. He was pronounced dead the next day, with the autopsy stating, abusive head trauma as the cause. A family friend, Jason Smith, said Alexandria was so protective of her infant son, she wouldn't even let him hold the boy, and that if three-month-old Dylan developed a cough or other illness, Tobias wouldn't hesitate to take him to the doctor. Whenever she took Dylan driving, Tobias made sure he was comfortable and safe. Smith said he was shocked when he learned that Alexandra Tobias had been charged with murder in the death of her only child, and still couldn't believe the news. Alexandra Tobias pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Susan Eubanks' story is an example of spousal revenge filicide. On October 26, 1999, Susan Eubanks of San Marcos, California, took the lives of her four sons. The boys ranging in age from 4 to 14 were all shot in the head. She then turned the gun and shot herself in the stomach. 
in the home with Susan's five-year-old nephew, who was found unharmed. Susan also survived her attempted suicide. Before the shootings, Susan spent the day drinking with her boyfriend and taking Valium when they began to fight. She left, but when she came back to the home, she slashed two tires of her boyfriend's car and refused to let him in the home. He called the police, and they then escorted him to the home, where he removed some belongings and left. But he did call one of Susan's exes to tell him she talked about killing herself and the boys. That father then called the police department. He asked the sheriff's department to check on the children. When the deputies arrived at the home, they heard sobbing, and inside found the three older boys dead from gunshot wounds to the head. The youngest was not yet dead, so an ambulance was called to the scene. The four-year-old boy was then rushed to the hospital, where he would later die. They also found Susan sobbing and suffering from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to her stomach. She was also sent to the hospital. After five days, Susan was charged with four counts of first-degree murder. The police found a note at the home that was addressed to her estranged husband. In it, Susan wrote, You betrayed me. I've lost everybody I've loved. Now, it's time for you to do the same. Her trial began in August 1999, and the state alleged that Susan had killed her four sons as a result of rage, which was a result of anger felt toward their fathers and the boyfriend, whom had all chosen to leave her. They claimed that she felt the desire to seek revenge for the failure of their relationships that she had wanted the fathers to also know the pain of losing those that had been loved. The defense made claims that their murders took place as a result of blacking out, that as a result of the diminished state of mind, she was not in control of her actions, that after spending the day drinking and using prescription drugs, along with past heartaches and current domestic disturbance, she then became a robot and did what she thought would remove her pain. Susan E. Banks was sentenced to death and is currently serving out her sentence at the Central California's Women's Facility. Mothers Who Kill, Cross-Cultural Patterns in and Perspectives on Contemporary Maternal Filicide, a paper by Michelle Oberman, sums up maternal filicide in this way. At the most basic level, maternal filicide is a crime committed by mothers against their own children, and therefore is, by definition, a reflection on the individual mother's experience of the conditions under which she was expected to raise her child. By focusing on the circumstances surrounding the mother who kills her child, it becomes clear that maternal filicide is not a random, unpredictable crime committed predominantly by mentally ill women. Instead, it is deeply embedded in and responsive to the societies in which it occurs. As such, the circumstances that surround maternal filicide in different cultures vary widely. Nonetheless, a careful analysis of contemporary cases confirms one fundamental similarity. In virtually every instance, maternal filicide is committed by mothers who cannot parent their child under the circumstances dictated by their particular position in place and time. enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you want to inquire about a commission, you can email Russell at russellstewart.art at gmail.com. You can watch Russell live stream his art on Twitch. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, you can subscribe to my podcast, Crimes of a Decade, a Texas true crime podcast. Now that we are done, make sure to wash the brush. Just beat the devil out of it.